Well, it's over. Hello, everybody. Welcome back to the Songcast. I'm Patrick. I'm Matt. I'm Garrett. I'm Nate. And it's over. It's o- And it's over. Uh, the Mariners did not make the postseason. Um, after a stellar one-year streak of making the postseason, that streak has ended at one. <laughs> yeah, we uh, <laughs> count them. Uh, what to say? It sucks. Uh, one thing that really frustrates me is that like two weeks ago, I was like, well, you know, we know we're a playoff team. We're going to make the playoffs. It would take an epic collapse for that, for us to not make it. And sure enough, the collapse was epic, and we are spending October at home waiting for March. Yeah, the Mariners had every opportunity to put themselves into the playoffs and play into it. You know, we're like, I keep, keep saying we're the newcomers to the playoff situation. We just didn't play into it. And 11 and 17 September is not playoff worthy. You know, we went 11 and 15 in April and 9 and 15 in June. And September looked a lot like that, where like Julio was pressing really hard to try to bolster our team. We're swinging and missing a lot. We didn't have the right kind of atmosphere to to have a sustained winning streak i i kept saying this last couple of weeks no no no, we're gonna get hot again like we've been hot and cold but i was expecting us to get hot at the right time here at the end of the season and it didn't uh didn't work out that way we ended up with 88 wins yeah less and than last year yeah, we've been talking all year about how like 90 wins is really that line and we probably need 92 wins to like really bolster our spot or like really nail it down, but we didn't reach that threshold. So, here we are, sad boys at the end of September, going into October without playoff baseball in Seattle. Soggy sad boys over here. What can we put the blame on? What were the reasons the Mariners did not make the playoffs? Losing Robbie Ray didn't help. Um, you know, it's easy to forget about because he literally pitched the first game of the season, yeah. and then he's been out the entire year. Uh, he had his ups and downs his on his own right last year, but still, he would have been beneficial to the team. Imagine if we had him making starts over, let's say, Brian Wu. You know, not even anything negative, really, about Brian Wu, but... Robbie Ray is a better pitcher than Brian Wu. That, that's so that's one thing. I put the Robbie Ray injury up there. Uh, Julio with runners in scoring position and in, with games on the line. It seems like that's where he really, really struggled the most. He was he had an amazing season. You know, there's no taking away the great season that Julio had. Setting records every single day. Going 30-30, I yeah. mean, an amazing season, but was, you're exactly a, right. Those clutch moments just never showed up. Yeah, there was so many times. I mean, throughout the entire season, JP did his part and got on base or gave Julio a chance to be the star, and he just doesn't have, him, have it in him. At least not yet. He's 22. He's still plenty of time to come in and be that clutch player, but we needed it this year. And he was not it, unfortunately. I want to go back one point. Just injuries in general. That yeah. really messed us up this year. We are down Tom Murphy. Jared Kellenick was out for a while. We lost Penn Murphy. You said Robbie Ray. Tons of injuries. Marco Gonzalez. Marco. Yeah. Imagine if Marco was starting instead of these younger guys. Even Andres Munoz was out at the beginning of the year, and it took him some time to get back into form. Like... We had a lot of injuries this year, especially to our left-handed starting pitching, which like we had to go all right-handed. And it's great to see Bryce Miller. It's great to see Brian Wu get their opportunity and come in and show what like value they have in the major leagues at the top level. And they both show that they can they can really battle it out up here and figure things out at this level, which 
I don't know. It makes me think what happens when Robbie Ray comes back and we have Marco for one more year and we can put lefties in our rotation. Like, who's on, a, who's on the trade block? Who goes to our bullpen? We'll see what kind of movement happens with our pitching. Um, yeah, and speaking of the bullpen, losing Seawall didn't help any at all. I mean, that not was a real spending bummer. a lot of money on great players. I was going to say, that's, yeah. a, that's a huge one right there. I mean, but we, yeah, we, we started our season. all these things. Started our season with Pollock, with Stella, you know, Colton Wong. Wong. Yeah, they, just, they didn't go spend for that extra guy, like even a Hunter Renfro or someone like that. Like we really underspent in the off season and we knew it. We were kind of like, ah, we're at least a bat light. And like, it would have been nice to keep Santana around for a little bit of punch and like good atmosphere. But yeah, we totally underspent and then tried to make a trade mid season where it did help us out. It made us more flexible, but also it didn't pack the punch we needed. It's not like we got more slug out of it. You know what I mean? It's frustrating because these are all issues we talked about during the off season too. And after the off season was done and beginning the season, you know, we knew we weren't going to be fortunate with the same pitching health that we had last year. Uh, thankfully, our, our rookies came up and, you know, we had decent starting pitching depth. Not a lot of bullpen depth, though. We had Munoz out for first what few months of the year pretty much um and then lost Penn Murphy out of the pen too a lot of extra guys had to step up get called up um so relying on or yeah had injury regression from last year for sure and then yeah what we talked about all off season not not adding enough not spending enough you know we didn't really fully address the gaps that we had last year that we identified and we knew coming in like we we Juan and Pollock and Listella were not going to be the answers. And another thing really cost the Mariners, Scott being cute. Scott being cute. We needed to win these last few games, and he literally sets the lineup like you're playing a video game with right-handed and left-handed splits. He does not seem to understand that professional left-handed hitters can hit left-handed pitching. It's the only team I've ever seen it where, oh, a left-handed pitcher is throwing on the opposing team, so the entire lineup has to be right-handed. We have to we had to win these games to make the playoffs. And you have Haggerty in your starting lineup, you have Caballero in your starting lineup, you have more in your starting lineup, strictly just because they hit right-handed, it does not make any sense. It blows my mind. Yeah, it sucks to see like the platoon structure over here. It's we don't play Kellenic versus left-handed hitters like Kellenic has a higher average against left-handed hitters than he does against right-handed hitters we were giving him more op- like opportunities earlier in the season which was great but we didn't see that down the stretch after he came back from his injury we didn't hit Mike Ford in situations where we needed a big hit and he's the guy that packs a punch off of our bench like he's He's the guy, and and they know that we, the Mariners, the other teams know that we play right into their hand because they know if they pitch left-handed pitching, we're going to hit our worst batters for most of the game and then try to match up down the line. And every bullpen has a guy with like reverse splits, you know, a right-hander that's good against left-handed pitching or a lefty that's good against right-handed pitching. There's usually a bullpen has a guy that kind of can be effective against the opposite hand or whatever it is and i don't know why the matchup play I don't, like you always say scott gets too cute right and i guess i just want to dig in a little more because it comes from the whole analytics team from the front office and everything and they do the research and i'm sure those guys are doing a good job getting the research done right because you can see it in the way that the mariners are trying to deploy a strategy on the field that plays to the averages right like the numbers but I don't think that the right kind of messages are being sent from the analytics and front office down to the coaching staff and to the player the right way I really think that delivery to the player and uh, coaching staff that really understands what those numbers mean and can relay that to the player in a way that helps their game and let the player play to their strengths and identify what the numbers are saying and help them make better decisions on pitches identify pitches early and understand their weaknesses and how the pitchers will attack them because the numbers will say that 
Like, you kind of have to play chess, and we're always a step behind. They just threw all lefties at us, and we couldn't do shit, and they knew exactly how to match up late in the game when we tried to pinch hit our lefties, and it, like, we were outmatched the whole last month of the season because they saw what we've been doing all year. It was too obvious. I want to know what strategy, what analytics they're looking at that tells you to have Kellenic on the bench, Teoscar starting in right field, and Haggerty as our starting DH. What analytics department is looking at the numbers? I feel like they're in Bizarro World where they accidentally looked at the opposite of what they should do and thought it was the correct move. And they were like, let's do that. Teo has had a good season. He's had his ups and downs. He is not a great defensive right fielder. He's become a liability. He And he, he hot dogs it out there. I've seen it a lot where just jogging the balls, not throwing it in. And that's an extra base. And, you know, in April, if someone gets an extra base, okay, whatever. When you're in the final, when you need to win these games, every single base matters. And you're having him hot dog it in right field, and Haggerty is our starting DH because he's right-handed. We needed Kellenic's defense in right field. And just, you know, Kenzone plays a pretty good left. Demo is serviceable, but we had Demo starting in left field. He's not a starting left fielder. He's a fucking platoon guy. That's fine. Teams need platoon guys, but you don't start your platoon guy in must-win games. It just, oh. Yeah, Teoscar in right field hasn't looked good. And I even brought it up early in the season. I thought we should play Kellenic in right field. He has a stronger arm. He's faster. Like, he goes after balls. And they're and it's the same thing. They're playing, like, which hand does he wear his glove on does he throw <laughs> with? Because they want the glove hand closer to the line side, right? So they play the right-hander in, in right field, and they play the left-handed guy in left field because they want that advantage on the line side, like fly balls, right? But that's bullshit. Like, switch those guys. You want the more athletic guy in right field. You want the guy that can go after a ball and make those plays and run like a football player running a route rather than the guy that's jogging into the corner and giving up the triple. You need the guy with the cannon. You need the guy that can get to a ball quick. And that's Kellenic all day. I even said that in our first few episodes. I was like, we're putting Kellenic in right, right? And no, like Teoscar, I think, should be in left field cause, because of his weaker arm or should just DH more. But I don't know, man. I agree. Like, I don't know where these analytics numbers are coming from to make the lineups because when I see the lineup card, that's not how I would build a lineup. Like, there is obvious mismanagement happening and it's it sucks to see as a fan because in must win games and you're starting your your three le- least impressive batters <laughs> like it's like dude are we trying to lose i'm confused it, it is confusing and and there's gotta something's gotta get rattled around here but something's gotta change i'm not sure Along with the whole platoon thing, I think Rojas, too, has proved that he's not a platoon second baseman. Like, he should be our everyday second baseman, not platooning with cabs. Like, yeah. He could easily be a everyday second baseman. Yeah, he's maybe not an all-star, but he holds it down there, fine defense. He hits for a decent average, gets on base at a pretty good clip. I mean, why were we not? I, just the handedness that Scott plays with just pisses me off. Like, I don't care if it's a lefty on the mound. I'd rather have I have more faith in Rojas and Kelnick being up there than, you know, having Haggerty and, and Caballero up in those, especially the last week of the season, 10 games left, do or die. We only needed to win, came down to we only needed to win six of these last 10 games. We didn't do it. Nope. Man, it makes me sad that we didn't go get an extra guy during the trade deadline now because we know our roster is going to expand at the end of August going into September. We know we're going to need two extra bats on the bench, and all we had was a bunch of like fast running guys, you know, like utility players, Haggerty and more. And then, yeah, Rojas could have been our everyday starting second baseman probably. Should have been. Yeah. We, we, I like Rojas a lot. And like you're saying, man, like lefties can hit lefties. We just don't know because we don't give them the fucking opportunity. Like, I feel bad for Mike Ford. There were a few games a couple weeks ago where I was like, why? Why? Just let him try. This is the guy you hit in this situation, regardless of who's on the mound, especially like Araldis Chapman. Dude, like, no way. No way Mike Ford can't hit an Araldis Chapman fastball. The dude can't locate. 
make force him to throw a fastball and get all over it. Mike Ford's that guy, and we didn't give him the opportunity. And it, it's tough, man. I feel bad for guys like that. Where you're like, this is the guy that we need to put the ball over the fence or in the gap because there's runners on base. He's the powerful guy on our bench. This is the pinch it situation for this. And we end up hitting, like, I don't know, Canzone or, or uh, Rojas. And that's fine. Or not even them, but right-handers like Dylan Moore or Caballero because of the matchup. <laughs> yeah, because of the matchup, they'll hit a right-hander is kind of what I'm trying to say here. But Yeah, all week not the right it should guy. have been Ford, Kellenick, Rojas, and we kept getting Caballero, Dylan Moore. Just... And even worse, on top of that, then they would... You know, the Rangers would go into their bullpen in the sixth inning, and then Scott completely depletes the bench because it's like, oh, different-handed pitcher now. Now let's pinch hit all these guys. So now you have all these guys who have been sitting on the bench for an hour and a half. They're cold, and now they got to come in and face pitching just like that. And just, it's it's mind-blowing. It, You know, armchair coaches and stuff and, like, you know, couch quarterbacks – you know, it's easy to say, oh, you should have done this, you should have done this. But when the evidence of the plan that the Mariners are sticking with is not working, like, it's very clear that their plan is faulty. It's not working. And they just, what? Oh, just keep rolling the dice, sunken cost fallacy. Uh, it's going to work eventually. Like, so, no, it's not. So, Patrick, and now we're out of the playoffs. <laughs> you sent a. Uh, uh, tweet to our group chat like someone on twitter or whatever alex ssn he said the mariners strategy around the lineup tonight seemed questionable from the jump but you but got more suspect as it played out you just can't run a lineup of all these defense speed guys that don't hit much then pull them all before they contribute any speed or defense yeah and says it reeked of overthinking and being a little too cute which is what patrick has said all year <laughs> and it's been problematic all year S- service will wear this yeah he'll wear this for the org because he has to there's got to be more accountability from the people behind the scenes who are pulling the strings on these decisions which is exactly what we're saying like yeah he just put it into a nice little blurb and thanks alex i mean you probably listen to our podcast <laughs> <laughs> sounds like what we're trying to say and but we just say it in a roundabout way every week <laughs> just takes us an hour uh, to do it yeah, yeah. And, and right into that point too like teams know our tendencies now and they know our fear of matchups lefty lefty righty righty and it was the thursday game i believe in about the sixth or seventh inning we were trying to come back and we were to the like six through nine spot in our order which that day was like demo Haggerty, and caballero um you know normally late in the game like that you would pinch hit pinch hit your bats we could have brought our lefties in their starter was out of the game but they brought another lefty in out of the bullpen they didn't care about the lefty righty matchup um because i i feel like this was their thinking that they knew if they throw a lefty in there, Scott's not going to be able to throw in Kelnick, Rojas, and Ford in that situation as pinch yep. hitters because he won't we hit lefty proved lefty. That we don't. Yeah. yeah. So and they're they going to exploit in, it. They threw yep. in their lefty and they got out our three weakest hitters. They're one move and, ahead of us. And we had to wait two more innings till the next rotation through to the six, seven, nine spot to uh to put in Rojas. And I think we did finally put in Rojas and um too little, too and late. And Kelnick in that game, but way too little, too late. I mean, came back and won thanks to JP, but yeah, it's getting, almost almost bit us in the butt there. Getting outmanaged. Yeah, and it's just like, I don't know what Scott's trying to prove. Like, he's just trying to go galaxy brain, but how many times does it have to not work before you're like, you know what? Maybe we should try something different. So Cal Raleigh, the other night had a, a quote after the game, right? He's, he's been beat up this September, too. He's been playing so many games. Cal because, Raleigh played too many games this year. Yeah, and he was getting his ass kicked back there. Yeah. Like, so many foul balls off of his inner thighs. Like, he was absolutely grinding it out, and I have so much respect for Cal. Yes. Uh, well, he said, anytime you can add, I mean, look over in the Texas locker room right there. They've added more than anybody else, and look where it got them, he said after Saturday's loss. 
He said, there's more than one way to skin a cat, that's for sure. But going out and getting those big names, people who have done it, people who have been there, people who are leaders, people who have shown time and time again that they can be successful in this league is definitely what would help in this clubhouse. And that's what we've been harping on all year. Like, go get that proven guy. Go spend a little bit of money. The Mariners are the lowest of all the payrolls of all the teams that made the playoffs, like were in the playoff race. 137 million is the lowest of all of those, even lower than the Minnesota Twins. Like, we need to spend money on proven commodities. And we've only spent on pitching. We got Robbie Ray and signed him up. We got Luis Castillo, Castillo and signed him up. We got Teoscar on a one year deal. Either we extend the qualifying offer or we try to sign him up. Or go elsewhere, but if Teoscar walks, especially like who who do we sign up? And Eugenio Suarez, he's great. Like defensively, he doesn't have the range, but he's a rock over there for us. But offensively, it's a question mark, man. Ty France too, with the regression he's had, we have to figure out who the guys are in arbitration that we lock up now and spend around the rest of that. And I don't know who's on the block to go, but it seems like Ty France. We could platoon for Eugenio Suarez if we get a power bat at third base so that we don't strike out over 200 times a year. I love that he plays every game, but I wouldn't mind having another punch left-handed, even if we take a little bit of a defensive hit at third base to like get a little bit of a punch at third base. I love what uh, JP has done to improve his game every single year, and he's going to continue to lead this team. And Julio, too, is going to mature like you were talking about earlier. He's still young. He's learning. He was pressing too hard all season. Mm -hmm. We saw it, and it didn't pay off. He needs to be more patient. I mean, the Mariners need to hit the ball more. That's the thing. Get on base and slug. We left so many runners on base. It's frustrating. I don't know. One thing I'll kind of disagree with, I do not see a platoon at third happening with Suarez just because the dude is also a horse. He's there like Cal Raleigh. Uh Suarez became the fifth Mariner today to play in 162 games in a season. Did not take a single game off. They had him not start one game, and then he came in in, like, the sixth inning. So he played in all 162. And actually, Garrett, remember, uh, this is like, last year even, we were looking at Suarez's numbers, and the dude averages 150-plus games played every single year. Mm -hmm. The dude is out there, night in and night out, and I just don't see... With the amount of playing time that he's used to, I don't see him being on board to being platooned and taking, you know, a night off a week even. That's just not, not his thing. Uh, I am at a crossroads with Suarez. I love his defense. I like him a lot. The strikeouts was just too much. He did end up with almost 100 RBIs on the season, which is crazy. Um, he did come through in some clutch moments, kept the train moving. A lot of strikeouts, though. I, you know what? If he can find some way to knock fifty strike uh, strikeouts out of his game, I, you know, I'd want him forever. Yeah, that'd be great. The last two years, one hundred ninety six strikeouts. I think it was ninety four, ninety six, but almost two hundred. And this year, two fourteen. Like. He struck out a lot, and we, like I said earlier in the season, like you, you know what to expect from him. You know his average is going to be from two twenty to two forty somewhere, and you hope that he can get those big hits and big moments because you know you're only going to get a certain amount of them. You hope they're homers and doubles with bases like people on base, but down the stretch it wasn't. You know he only hit that one home run on Saturday to prevent the shutout, and. uh I mean, it was kind of rough down the stretch for Gino. I was hoping he'd come through with some of those clutch hits down the road. But I love him. I love that he plays every day. And I don't know about a platoon situation or if we should keep him. I don't know what the deal is. But that's just a piece I thought may be variable in the future. I see. Suarez is absolutely one of my favorite players, and I'd love to see him around forever. But I'm with you, Patrick. He's got to 
take those strikeout numbers way down. I think last year he set a club record for most strikeouts. <laughs> Sick. Yeah, it's pretty awesome. <laughs> yeah, and it's, the thing is, though, at least, at least he has other aspects of his game. So the defense can't be understated. I will be absolutely shocked if he does not win the gold glove this year. Um, and he's handsome and he blows a bubble, and that's all <laughs> you could ask for. Also, I noticed last year, this is more of just like a PR standpoint, but last year the Mariners really pushed the Suarez good vibes only. They had the tank top giveaway that I rock all the time. It's an awesome shirt. But they really pushed the good vibes only thing. And that's another thing that kind of we've talked about a little bit this year is this team almost seemed like it lacked identity. The Trident. The Trident. Okay, yeah, we had the Trident. And the Trident was huge. And the Trident is huge. But It's like one of the coolest celebrations in the league. I, I do, I, I'm a huge fan of the Trident. I thought it was a little forced at first. It was it, at it, first, It definitely. became our identity, and it was good. It's I still dope. like it. Yeah. But last year, we our identity was Chaos Ball and, good and the only. Good Vibes Only. And we didn't really have that this year. We had the Trident. But even, I don't know, it even felt like when we were hot in August, it just it felt like... I don't know. On paper, everything was working. The Mariners set a franchise record for wins in a month. But it's still it just identity list, you know? He did say that when Julio goes, the team goes. And he was hot as shit in August, and then September was crappy. That's true. That, that did happen. Julio got hot, the team got hot. Julio cooled down, the team cooled down. Like, that did follow suit there. That's kind of yeah. crazy. Um, and you've been, you've been saying that, but... The team does what Julio does. And I think Matt's been saying that. Oh, yeah. yeah. And right. just, but I'll take credit for it. <laughs> <laughs> I want to add one, one thing to that list, like good vibes only and the chaos ball, the embrace the chaos thing, but also believe. Like we didn't whip out our believe posters. I, that's just, a good point. I was going to mention that too. Yeah. Just because the 20 year drought was over, it was believe, but now it's not. Like, yeah, still believe. Uh, God damn it. Uh, <laughs> yeah. I'm sure that you have 17 of those in your in your closet go like bring them to the game and hand them out again like uh, reprint them and make <laughs> people believe i felt like even the fans had a lack of identity like we weren't around the team as much as we were last year we didn't like love them as much i will say the the fans never stopped showing up and showing out and supporting of course uh, yeah. we just i just saw on twitter today um we were i don't have the exact number but we we're over two and a half million total attendance for the season, and it was our most since 2005. Oh, yeah. So fans are coming. Fans are supporting the team. Ooh, this is a quick tangent, but this really pisses me off when you have, like, Scott Service and, like, PR releases, like, oh, the fans need to come out. The fans need to come out and support the team. Come cheer on your boys. We need your support. You know how many, I went to a ton of sold out games this year, and I think the Mariners won like two of them out of like (laughs) nine or 10 sellouts that I went to. Every sellout, every big like promotional event, like Mariners Hall of Fame induction, like Felix weekend, like every, every push to get people out to the park, we shit the bed in those games and we, and we foolishly still kept fucking coming back and selling out the stadium. That's true. Uh, <laughs> I didn't go to very many games, but I did go to the Steelheads jersey giveaway night, and we lost that game, too. <laughs> yeah. Damn, you guys are right about that. Oh, it's clear. It's yeah, so the fans showed up, did their jobs, got their cool free promo stuff, cheered on the boys, and yeah, it was all PR. The Seahawks didn't, didn't have mean the anything. 12th man, right? And they yeah. like cheer on their team, and it helps. And it seems like when we're packed and we're cheering our Mariners to the full, like the fullest extent, it just it's too much for like the players. Yeah, it's they like, don't handle it. Yeah, <laughs> maybe I, we I, need no sellouts next year. Yeah, uh, no two. one go to a single game next year. <laughs> we were too fans. electric. <laughs> it's a bobblehead game. Damn Keep it. it to like twenty thousand people. <laughs> yeah, we can we can win those cold rainy wednesday night games <laughs> with like two thousand people in the stands, but pack the house and yeah, we're screwed. There's also the Thai France cheering section last year. I don't think they did very much of that this year with the, 
the rubber baguettes. baguettes and yeah, the, no, the what is it? It's like south of France something or something like that. I think it's they called. even had fresh baked baguette giveaway <laughs> oh, like yeah. one night. Yeah, there's uh, you know, obviously the J Rod squad is always there, yeah. hyping Julio up, but should be. Yeah, but, you know, it should be. But yeah, as far as identity things like that go, um, the Thai France supporters were not. They didn't have a lot to go out there and do <laughs> but I mean, there's just another identity thing that didn't really happen. Is there a, I think it was kind of a burnout from last year too in fandom, like the fandom world, right? There's more Mariners fans than there were last year because they showed out and now there's more, you know, we call bandwagon fans, right? But like there's more new fans now than there ever has been. The vibe is a little bit different than it was last year where it was more hardcore like we've been Mariners fans and waiting mm-hmm. for this. And now there's a whole new wave of new Mariners fans. And I feel like, like I was saying, as a fandom, uh, when I'm at the stadium, there's kind of a, it's kind of a washed out uh, enthusiasm as compared to last year. We didn't, and we didn't whip out all the good, like Soto Mojo, or like two out. So what? Like whip out something that, that we can all rally around. Believe. You're starting uh, to sound like an old chaos. man. Like, yeah, well, you I, don't understand. You don't the have Mariners the same trauma. Age us. I have gray, hairs in my beard and half of them are from <laughs> mariners <laughs> fandom so but yeah you're like you, they don't understand our trauma what we went through they're not fans like we're no, fans. no i love it it's just that we need to <laughs> no i totally get what you're saying as the mariners they need to have more promotions to get people invested like they were last year but get behind a slogan and get behind something so we didn't have that momentum either so yeah. uh Anyway, that's just the that's just the fans, not the actual performance. We on could the talk field. for days and days and days about what went wrong this season and what ifs and if this guy didn't get hurt and if we had managed the team this way. What went right this year? JP Crawford. JP Crawford stepped the fuck up and got it done this year. And so one thing that's interesting is JP has been a huge uh, part of this kind of new technology swing program that's taking over a lot of baseball. It's becoming really big. It's this driveline facility. They have a, a location in Kent. Um, JP has been a part of that, and it seems like it's really, really taking off. They increase, like, uh, barrel rate, swing speed, like all this stuff. And JP has been like, yeah, I've been in driveline. I've been in driveline. I've been in driveline. And we've seen the results. This year was crazy to go from the down year he had last year to now being the most clutch player on this team. And not even just like hard swings and barrel rates. He was also making smart decisions at the plate. He, even though his, um, uh, like, Swing velocity and all that was up. He wasn't swinging for the fences. He led the team in walks. He led uh, um, going he into also the last. Led the team in grand slams. Hey, but see, isn't that what you need? Yeah, someone that can take the walk or put the the power to the ball. So this drive line facility is like really, really big, and um, JP's kind of been at the forefront of that. And I saw Ty France is now. Going to join it in the off season. Him and JP are going to be working out in driveline together. Um, I mean, yeah, Nate and Matt, do you guys want to talk more about driveline and what it is and shit? Because I bet you know more than I do. Yeah, it's just like this, uh, like super advanced training facility down in good old Kent, Washington. Shout out Kent, my hometown. Hey. Um, and yeah, just basically they're pretty much the best in. It, for certain this reason, there's a bunch of out-of-town MLB players that actually come and train here. Shohei did a, a little bit of training here at Driveline last year. And yeah, they just use super advanced technology and create specific formulated plans for each player on how they can develop. They look for gaps in your swing, um, gaps in their swing. Like they went to JP Crawford and were like, look, we crunch numbers and if we can get your bat speed up something like three miles an hour, it's going to increase your bail rate by this percentage and your hard hit contact percentage by this amount. And it did pretty much exactly that for him this year. Yeah, Driveline's a place where they use advanced technology. They'll put sensors all over the place and cameras all over the place. They'll look at film from last year and see where, like, 
you could have done damage on this type of pitch, but you keep missing. Like they, they want to fill in those gaps, like you're saying, Nate. So yeah, they put sensors and cameras everywhere and they fix your holes. They say, you do this well, so you're going to keep doing this well by, yeah, I don't know. And JP, he just needed to swing the bat harder. We've seen JP take strides forward and I think he's been in driveline for a while, right? And Garrett and I especially have been watching him like, even though he had a down year last year and a breakout year in 21, like last year he started slapping the ball the other way better. And this year he started hitting the ball harder and like torquing the ball. He hit how many home runs? 19. He had 15. And three of those were grand slams. <laughs> yeah. Dude, two, three? Three. Damn. Three? Yeah. I think he had two. I thought it was two. It was three. Shit. All right. Well, he had 94 walks, led the league. He struck out 125 times, which is not bad. Um, a little bit more than he usually does, but that comes with swinging a little bit harder. His OPS was over 800. That's the first time in his career he's done that. A 131 OPS plus, like way better than league average. He was super clutch. It's also the place the strikeouts come into. Like I, I, I can only, from games I've watched and listened to, which was pretty much every game this year, <laughs> um, I can think of, I think, two situations where, you know, in a clutch situation where we need to expand a lead, you know, break a tie or get to a tie. I think he only struck out like a handful of times. Like, I only remember two instances where he struck out with, you know, the tying run on second base or the go ahead run on second base or something. And he he in those big situations wasn't afraid to work a walk. You know, he wasn't going to be out there swinging for the fences. So his plate approach this year was just phenomenal awesome well and we noticed it even like in april when he hit that 110 mile per hour double off the wall and very early on the season we were like whoa where the hell did this come from and now it's just become the norm for him to hit the ball that hard yeah he looks different like his bat angle before he hits is is more like coiled you know back towards his head a little bit more and like he gets more whip and more he swings harder and it was we noticed in the first couple months for sure we were like oh dude look at that torque baby like <laughs> yeah, yeah get it jp yeah yep. out there torquing, torquing it <laughs> last year yeah. was also noticeably kind of his his swing path his swing plane was kind of downward angle more yeah. almost more chopping at Choppy. the ball you know and this year it was a lot more level to to up which is what you want to hit hard line drives and occasionally those balls will carry over the fence as we saw it mm-hmm. do 19 times this year which was unprecedented power that we didn't really know he had yeah this is what the type of thing driveline can do if you're there for a few years it changes your bat path uh his uh fly out to ground out ratio is under one which is great he's like putting the ball in the air way more rather than chopping at it and uh that's the kind of thing driveline will do and what jp said he's gonna drag ty france into the driveline yeah. facilities and please fix ty france bring our boy please back do. wait but <laughs> with I... ty france's skills what can driveline do for him well i already thought the chiropractor fixed ty france's swing chiropractors Just are fake neck. doctors <laughs> do not go to chiropractors they're fake doctors they're scamming you out of money there's no such thing as an adjustment <laughs> also Honestly, the Ty France Snake chiropractor oil, shit dude. is right up at there with Drew Smiley's soggy arm. Like, for real. They were like, oh, no, he went to the chiropractor. They got his neck fixed, and now he's going to hit the hell out of the ball. And he did the exact same shit for the entire rest of the season. That will live in infamy, the he's, famous chiropractor yeah. appointment. <laughs> <laughs> he was just streaky, yeah. People were making excuses for him, you know. And, yeah, it sucked. Uh Ty France needs to be in drive line. Yes. So, I mean, Ty France is a guy that Get we're the concerned whole squad about. Squad in there. Why not? <laughs> Lock Ty France in there and don't let him out of the building until February 16th or whenever pitchers and catchers report. And then send his <laughs> ass directly from drive line on a plane down to Arizona. For real. The dude needs to step it up. At first base, we need some guy that produces offensively at first base we need a guy with slug we need a guy that can really drive in the runs and expect to be in the middle of our lineup every day uh as good as he is at first base like he lacks range but he's still a great first baseman he picks everything uh he can move and make swipe tags nicely he's good enough defensively at first base not quite a gold glove style first baseman because of the lack of range but he's great over there and i have no complaints he knows his infield well 
it's offense that he needs to really, yeah, put the ball in the air more. He needs to make the JP adjustment. So I'm I'm really glad that that's that's the news here. Also, to circle back to the original question of like what the Mariners did right this year, um, Logan Gilbert, George Kirby, Cal Raleigh, uh, Cal. I mean, he's kind of the unsung hero. He he's not a big like media guy, so he doesn't get as much like recognition as JP or as Julio and stuff. He doesn't have that big boisterous personality. He's no. really like calm. Yeah, he's yeah. calm. He's, he's, a, just, like, he's a catcher by nature. They're a little yeah. bit more kind of reserved and just strictly yeah. there to just go about their business. Straightforward. Yeah. yeah. Uh, they're the blue collar workers. Yeah, yeah. and he's a grinder. He is he's a sure. grinder. He's a workhorse. Lead by um, example, baby. Yeah. I mean, listen, I mean, Cal, led catchers in home runs led catchers in runners thrown out that's both sides of the ball that he was top. i mean literally top dog not like oh he was one of the best he was the best and switch hitting catcher that's crazy uh you know we also there's adley rutschman shout out adley rutschman shout Shout out out. adley rutschman but i mean you look at even five years ago a switch hitting catcher with this is unheard of. Does Jonah Heim switch hit too? I don't think he does. I'm going to look that up. Anyway, <laughs> uh, yeah, but he's been a, such a rock behind the plate and super underrated, especially we didn't really think about the leadership. We were talking about other players as being like the leaders, right? But I think Cal does lead a lot. And uh, Ty France even had a quote that said something like, uh, I mean, he'll come up to you and tell you if he thinks there's something wrong with what you're doing or what's going on. And Ty France was fully behind the things Cal had to say the other day, which I like a lot, like that they have each other's backs like that. Also, I wonder, this is going back to the TMZ from earlier in the season, (laughs) but we were speculating if Ty France and Cal were butting heads a little bit around the halfway point of the season. And then for Ty to be like, oh, if he has a problem with you, he'll tell you. And so I wonder if they were butting heads in the season and Cal just came up to him and was like, yeah, let's fix this shit. Sure. It seems like Ty knows it's strictly business, though, right. where he's like, if he's telling me, then there probably is something that I'm doing <laughs> that's pissing him off. And like, we should probably get it straightened out. You know, I don't think it's much of a tension. It's more just like, yeah, you're right, man. Like, I can't argue with Cal. Yeah, Cal's been in the news this week because of what he said after Friday's game. Saturday. Saturday. Saturday's game. After we got eliminated. Oh, yeah, yeah, that's right. Yeah, mm-hmm. I just read all that He's stuff. He's talking to the media. Yep, you read those quotes. You know, he said, go out and buy, do this, blah, blah, blah. Some people seem to take it the wrong way. I thought he was right. Everything he said was correct. And uh, anyone who was, you know, jumping on him about it is just like completely just misguided in, in their thought process or something. Oh, 100%. Ooh, that, there's then, one gripe I have with that. Um, Allison brought it up that like all the players, like you said, Logan and Ty um, pretty much came out today and like had his back, like said like, yeah, that's like what we're all thinking. Like he's not saying anything wrong. There's no reason for him to go out and apologize. And then they thanks. interviewed Scott and Scott was kind of soft about it, dude. He, didn't, he did not have his back. It sounds like he's more of an ownership puppet, honestly. Absolutely. Yes. He came out and he's said, a plant. he goes like, oh, yeah, it's a, it's a like, learning the, moment for Cal. He's like, it's not no, the right. It's a learning moment for Shut you, motherfucker. Fuck up, Scott. What are you doing? <laughs> he yeah. said, it's not the right time and the, the place to, or the right thing to say, you know, I get he wants to win, but like. It's not the time to do it. Like, when the fuck else is the time to do it, you idiot? <laughs> yeah, the, how about the end of the season when we saw the second team clinch on our field and you're pissed off that we didn't get the pieces we need to make the push? Like, why? when else are you going to say it? That's the exact right time to say it. And, like and we put saying, the fire on the front office. He's not, he, wasn't, he didn't even come out and be a dick about it. He was just correct. He's just yeah. spitting facts <laughs> in a very calm way. Just, you know, yeah, this is how we win. We should have gone out and did this. That's what I think. Yeah, and then exactly what you said, Ty France, a couple other people came out and said, like, I don't think anybody else in the clubhouse was thought he was wrong. Yeah. Except no reason. then Scott comes out and tries to mitigate any sort of damage. There was no damage done. It was totally fine what Cal did. And then he comes out today and apologizes, which he absolutely did not need to do. Hmm. That pissed me the fuck off. I was so mad. And the the whole hostage style apology. Blink twice if you're in trouble. (laughs) Yeah. Cal, are you being held hostage? You okay? 
And uh, kind of what Nate just said about like, you know, Scott being like a front office puppet. I think that's what he is. And, you know, we harp on Scott for the decisions he makes. I, I we don't know how much of that comes from upstairs and Scott because he's. I don't, I'll say weak in the knees. <laughs> yeah. uh, he's yellow. Yep. Um, <laughs> and Allison made that point. I didn't really think about it today until she brought that up. I was just shout too out too busy. Allison. Yeah, shout out frequent listener Allison. Yeah, mm-hmm. I was just too caught up in all the other Mariners shit, and she brought it up, and I was like, yeah, Scott's comments about that were the complete opposite of the players. It really draws the line between the product on the field and the front office, and it's obvious that Scott is now outside of the player's circle like the player's circle has their own thing and scott is on the other side of that line and that really sucks i also heard some people it this doesn't matter this is a such a non-issue being like oh shit cal said that they should spend more he was critical of the front office maybe he gets traded in the shut the fuck up (laughs) yeah right they cannot get rid of one of their top three players if and the top the top Catcher in baseball. And everyone's going to go to bat for him. Yeah. Sign him including up. Including Jerry and Scott and everybody. If anything, dude, no, there's just no shot. I'd sign Scott him for Service five years. Scott Service knows Cal Raleigh is such a dope catcher. If anyone knows, it's Scott Service. He's, he'll never let that happen. I'd sign him for five years tomorrow. Absolutely. Pay yeah. the man. Yes. He deserves it. Um, oh, but going back to how you started this whole thing, um, I'm with you, though. Cal, JP, Logan, dude, those guys are our rocks. That's our core right there. Kirby had a good season. Yeah, Kirby, one. Kirby had a good season as well. Um, he had some downs this year, which is bound to happen with a young pitcher. Uh, you know, there was the stupid drama with uh, his comments about wanting to be pulled early. Whatever, I'd chalk that up to just being a non-issue. It literally was something that just blew up out of nowhere. It didn't really need to. Whatever. I don't. I don't even think about that anymore. Kirby and Logan are the future of this pitching staff. Uh, one thing I think kind of goes unnoticed. Castillo was supposed to be our ace, and when the going got tough and we really needed him to show up, he did not. Not he had in a great season, but I mean shit. Saturday. Talking about his last start when he pitched seventy pitches in two innings, in eighty innings, and he was gave up four runs in the third inning, and it was just walk, walk, walk. And we talked about him giving up too many homers in the season, so now he's not trying to attack the zone as much, and then his walk numbers went way up. He's a great pitcher. We needed him to be an ace pitcher, and that was not the case when it mattered the most. I've talked about Castillo a few times this way where like he's an effectively wild type guy. When he's pitching his best, he's barely you missing say that the about zone. Brash too. <laughs> well, well yeah, they just throw their best shit and hope yeah. it beats the hitter, hope it fools them. If it's in the zone, hopefully the sh- it's good enough stuff that they're going to swing and miss. Right. Or that it's just grazing the zone or just out of the zone and getting a swing and miss. Like that's that's their game. They just throw the best stuff they can and hope it beats the hitter. Of course, they're trying to locate, but like that's secondary to, to the pitch they're throwing. They're trying to throw the best pitch they can, regardless of where it is. So the ride on on like Castillo's fastball, for example, like it, the problem with Castillo is like he's attacking these hitters and he's getting them into strikeout situations. But you can't remember. You have to remember. You can't forget that you're playing one of the best offenses in the league. So even if there's two strikes, they kind of battle like JP does, where. If you're throwing that fastball up and out to lefties, especially, it's an easy take. Like I was at the game on Saturday and he was throwing too many pitches, but some of those pitches were non-competitive pitches. He didn't have the put away pitch. He didn't like set them up for, he was throwing a nice change up. He should have thrown it more, but uh, there were just too many easy takes for the batters. You know what I mean? They weren't like around the zone enough and he wasn't locating well enough he was missing in non-competitive ways and it drove up his pitch count and plus those guys were fouling off pitches all day too like those they were tough hitters so 
it really does suck to see the season end for him like that, but that's the pitcher he is, and that's the pitcher he's going to continue to be, and you never know what you're going to get from him. If you're facing a tough offense, he's going to throw a lot of pitches early, and we've seen it throughout the year, but sometimes he can ride into the seventh and be under 90 pitches somehow. So um, it's really hit or miss. Sometimes he gives up the big hit. It's rare that he gives up that many walks, but it was just a tough offense and a tough part of the season where they were locked in. The Rangers were locked in, and it was tough to see Castillo get beat that way. I think Castillo was our ace, and he led our pitching staff that way. And it's great to see Gilbert becoming that guy and Kirby taking another step forward and having our young pitchers debut. But we need a lefty in our rotation. Robbie Ray should fill that spot. We have Marco for one more year. So we're going to figure out how that all shakes out, like I said earlier. And I think Luis Castillo is going to continue to lead this, lead this charge in our, uh, at the top of our rotation, but make the adjustments to put the ball on the ground and work on location rather than just stuff. Like that's the adjustment he has to make in the offseason is working on keeping the ball down in the zone and like locating better. Otherwise, his stuff looks great. So let's see. Our uh, rotation next year then should be Castillo number one. Maybe a Robbie Ray. Robbie Ray number one? No, a second. Oh, a second, yeah. Then I guess Gilbert third, although I could see Gilbert as our second. So Me same. too. Just depends on the matchups, yeah. So for me, I would go Castillo, Logan. Ray, Kirby, and then someone who, else. <laughs> and then who's the odd man out? Because then you have Marco. You have Marco, you have Miller, and you have Wu, who are, have all been starters. And Miller and Wu were starters from when they came up for the whole season. So is Miller the five guy? Hancock had a shot until he. Fucking Until he robbed you himself. Yeah, yeah it sucked. <laughs> uh, well, I mean, with the elite fastball that Miller has, he'd be a good addition to the bullpen, just like Brash had been. Like, he doesn't have a great secondary pitch yet, but I think his elite fastball works well in the bullpen more than it does in a starting role. Uh, I think Wu, he has more of a. Uh, he has more pitches. He can throw a slider, a curveball, a cutter. So I think he works. His pitch mix works better in a rotation, but we haven't seen him like really put it all together yet. We've seen a couple good starts from him, but um, I think he can take a step forward and be that guy. That's just that's what I think. I think either one of those guys can go to the bullpen or take a step up into the rotation, or we can trade one of those guys for a bat. You I know? was gonna say. I mean, they proved that they're commodities in the league now. I could see. Wu or even Miller being moved. Uh, spend money to make money. You gotta, you gotta trade someone to get somebody. So can we stop trading for prospects? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, this reminds me of a question I wanted to ask you guys. What's up? Overall, would you say the trade for Teoscar Hernandez trading Eric Swanson to the Blue Jays was overall the right thing to do? I I would. Yes. I think overall it, it came out as a success this year. Ate Oscar contributed. Strikeouts were too high. Um, didn't quite have the same power he had can't like last year with ball. Toronto. Yeah, can't hit a breaking ball. No, no one on our team can. That's another issue. Mm-hmm. Is, he came in and hit lefties well, but that's the only thing. That's what we needed him for, and he did that. But otherwise, when it came down to it, and our bullpen was just so depleted, we really could have used that extra arm. True. But yeah. I mean, we hindsight's twenty twenty. 20 yeah. It's hard to say that it was the right or wrong thing to do when, I mean, we know the results of it now, but I've been saying I from think the I'm get-go, with you guys. I've been saying from the get-go that we need to trade from our pitching strength to get bats, and like that's the obvious way, and the Blue Jays needed something, we needed something, we made it happen, and they're both good players, and I think it was the right move, and we should continue to do that. We have a lot of pitching and we need bats so we're gonna have to continue to trade from our pitching to get real offense follow-up question from that uh what do you guys think about the paul seawald trade i could have done without it i think we should have kept seawald it's nice to have a second baseman who can play but then we would have seen a lot of pollock and wong 
Like, what do we do with them at that point? Because we had to get rid of them by making a move there. Like, I don't think we would have seen more Wong. Yeah, Shoot, we probably would've. would've just been a we lot would've. more Caballero. We would've, yeah, would've been Wong, Wong and Caballero instead of Rojas and Caballero. I really think we would've DFA'd Wong if we weren't able to get anybody at the trade deadline to fill his spot. Like, we would've just, yeah, used what we had. And DFA'd Dylan Moore either was, way. Yeah, yeah, I, I, yeah, I honestly think that. Too. That's yeah. why I so think he was on our Dylan team Moore that long. Oh, that's true, a lot more Dylan Moore. Yeah, he would've been back. Hmm. Haggerty would've been in the mix, but... And then they were in the mix at the end of the season anyways, you know, whether they should have been or I not. I think it actually came out as pretty much a net zero trade. Um, it hurt for sure, I think, but I, I don't know. It feels like it came out pretty balanced. We lost a few games because of a bullpen, but we also won a few games because we had a bit more offensive production where we were lacking in left field. Yeah. Get with uh, Canzone and at second base with Rojas. We got good production out of them. That's lost true. a bit from the bullpen. Um, so I think it probably came out to about zero added or lost extra wins. I feel like it's a pretty net even situation too. Like Seawald would have been nice to have in those late game situations, but also the added offense helped our team win games. So yeah, I'm with you there, Nate. Like, uh, it's, it's cool, but we just got a couple more young players that need to prove themselves. We don't like, like Cal said in his quote, we need to be buying proven commodities, guys that have been there, guys that have leadership in the clubhouse. But we added a couple guys that were following along to the momentum the Mariners had already trying to blend into this clubhouse as something that contributes after Kellenic got hurt, especially. And like, the the culture isn't there yet, man. We're I keep saying it. We're naive. We're new to this whole the mix, and I don't like that there's a separation between our players and front office. I don't like that that the front office is treating things so black and white and so analytically, and not they're not being romantic or playing the hot hand or getting a player that can really make a difference, like. They didn't help the team win. The team went out there and battled their ass off all season. We saw that, good or bad. Like the beginning of the season, we saw them give up a little bit, but down the stretch, they were in it every every game, every at bat. Gino's yelling "fuck" like when he strikes out. I can hear it on the radio. Like <laughs> so is JP. Dude, it's ev- loud. you can hear everything they say, and they're they're in it to win it. And they just didn't get what they needed. And I think I'm I'm totally behind Cal. Like he summed up what I've been thinking for the second half of the season. Even though they were hot, like we're still missing those pieces that really make the difference. Well, Mariners fans, we thank you all for sticking with us. We're going to do one more episode next week after our emotions have kind of cooled. We can I mean I thought we were pretty level headed throughout this one, but Still, emotions are high for all of us. It was, at the end of the year, it was a disappointing season. It was I feel f- nothing. <laughs> yeah, I thought Nate was pretty unhinged this episode, honestly. <laughs> Dude's off his rocker. Uh, thank you guys for being with us throughout the season. We will have one more episode for you guys next week. Uh, it's been so much fun doing this throughout the year. Next week, we'll do a full wrap-up. Now, highs, lows, what to expect next year, what we want, yep. all that good stuff. It really has been a roller coaster ride. And thanks for sticking with us. It's been uh, tough for us to make it through this whole season, too. There's a lot of highs and lows, and here we are. It's hard being a Mariners fan. It's hard. It's been a lot of sadness and uh, defeat clutched from the jaws of victory. <laughs> um, it was an epic collapse the only thing we couldn't do was completely shit the bed and that's what the Mariners did very sad but we all had fun doing this thank you all so much for being a part of it we'll be back for one more final episode next week and actually I want to give one special shout out before this episode ends uh, every week we do this and we make a lot of mistakes We say some dumb shit. We say shit that cannot make the airways. (laughs) Um, And there's sometimes gaps or pauses. And the reason that does not get carried over into the final product is the amazing editing skills of Garrett. 
He single-handedly edits every single one of our episodes and cleans all that stuff up. Uh, he is a huge reason why we're able to put this out every week. So I really, really wanted to give you a shout out for all the work you've done and for making this pod happen. Thanks, Thank- man. I appreciate that. It's yeah. fun. We appreciate you because uh, our fans at home don't see it. The amount of effort it takes to edit and to dial all this stuff in and clean stuff up, it can't be understated. So thank you so much, uh, Garrett. And thank you for our fans for listening. And you guys all get to take part of Garrett's finished product. The true MVP. Yes. I'm not going to let you wrap this show up without me giving it back. Hmm. I can't just sit here and take that. <laughs> The whole reason I wanted to get this together was because you guys, I mean, we're always talking about baseball anyway. I figured might as well get the microphones out and put it out there. Mm -hmm, That's how it started. Someone's going to want to hear it. (laughs) And I mean, you guys know so much. You're all wealths of knowledge where I'm relatively new to the baseball scene. So I'm here. I get a mic, but (laughs) I do it mostly for the edit and for the final product. And I need you guys to do that. Like I get you guys here. Make you talk into microphones so that <laughs> I can put it out. Hey man, it so takes, thank you guys for it takes a village. It takes all types yeah. here. Like we all need each other to put this product out. And I really enjoy my time here talking to you guys every week. We've always talked baseball our whole existence as friends, and we're always yelling, talking over each other. And this makes it nice to have mics and spread everything out. And let everybody else hear what we have to say because uh, I like our opinions. I like when we disagree. I like uh, just talking about baseball with my friends. And that's what matters the most to me. Win or lose, Mariners make the playoffs or not. Uh, this has been awesome for sure. Yeah, Thank you. Also, a quick side note. Another reason why we started this is we were listening to a lot of other people talk Mariners and we just really disagreed with a lot of the points that they were saying. And some of the stuff, it just didn't make a lot of sense to us. You got to throw your own hat in the ring. Yeah. And so we were like, well, if these guys are talking and they're not very knowledgeable, <laughs> maybe we can drop some knowledge. And that's our goal is to make our fans the most informed Mariners fans. Yeah. And if you if you think we're stupid, if you think <laughs> we're saying a bunch of domes shit like Which we are. We yeah, are all we stupid. Are. Please <laughs> leave comments and like make us look stupid or something. So we like, you know, give us the fire we need. Give us uh, more topics to get involved here because we really want it to. Like, it, it's a lot of fun doing this. And I, I want to be proven wrong if I'm saying some dumb shit too. So yeah, keep it up, fans. So send us that hate mail. <laughs> <laughs> send it. <laughs> no, I love you guys. Love you all. Thank you all so much for listening. We will be back next week for our final episode of the year. And I guess, you know, it's not going, the season isn't going anymore, but still, go Mariners! Shout out Owen.